Welcome back to Steel City Sports. Today we're starting a new series here on the channel called the NBA Chronicles. And essentially what we're going to do in this series is take a look back at some teams of the past and look at where it all went wrong. And we're also going to look at some weird situations. But I thought the best way to start this series would be with the big three Brooklyn Nets. I've been watching basketball since the 2016-17 season, you know, the, the year KD won his first ring with Golden State. So since then... This, I think, is the most bizarre situation to ever pan out because the Brooklyn Nets went from a team that I thought was going to run the NBA for the next five years to quickly being, right now, I don't even think they're a playoff-level team. You know, you know, under two years, uh, all members of that Nets Big Three are no longer even on the team. So I think it's really bizarre. I want to look back at the story behind all this, the rise and fall, very quickly fall of this Nets team. Um, so, yeah, I guess we should start in the 2019 season. Uh, where KD was still with the Warriors, Kyrie was still on the Celtics. And uh, I know that behind the back, you know, in the background, KD and Kyrie were, uh, they had been planning to team up. You know, they were good friends. Um, they became like good friends. It's reported at the 2016 Olympics in uh, Rio. Um, so I don't know exactly when they planned, like, yeah, we're actually going to do this. Because, you know, they were probably talking about it here and there, but. Who knows whenever they started seriously planning to team up? Because I remember at that time, like April and May and June of that year, there were a lot of rumors going around as to um, – because we heard the report, like, Katie and Kyrie, they want to team up. But I didn't know how realistic it was, A, and B, I didn't think KD was ever going to leave the Warriors because the whole reason KD went to the Warriors was to win championships and to submit his legacy and – uh I think that if Kevin Durant hadn't left the Warriors, I think the Warriors would have won five championships at this point in time. I think four at the least um, because they already had the two before he left. But if he stays, just looking at it, like 2020, you take that out because KD's Achilles was still uh, not healed. Clay was still not back. Steph, although I think Steph's injury was kind of – his hand injury was kind of played up that year just to, like, let him take a year off because Warriors management knew that that team was, was crap. So – um, I think that injury was played up, but let's just say take out the 2020 season because of injuries. But let's say 2021, they're fully healthy. Um, even if Clay does get injured again like he did in 2021, you're still going to have Steph and KD in their primes and Draymond, who was still a high-level defensive player at that time. Um, you obviously wouldn't have Wiggins because of the d trade. You wouldn't have d to trade for Wiggins, so it'd be kind of interesting to see what that bench looks like. But I think, hypothetically, Steph and KD with a decent supporting cast is good enough to win a championship. And you look at you know the team that won in 2021, the Milwaukee Bucks, uh, really good team. But KD basically on his own almost beat that Bucks team in the second round. If his foot is like an inch back, and we're going to talk about that later in this, uh, if it's even a centimeter back, the Nets win that series, and they probably would have won the title that year because Kyrie would have been back eventually. And uh, Harden, I don't think there's any way Harden could have been any worse than he was in that game. Um, so, so yeah, I think they win it that year. 2022, the Warriors already won the title, so I think adding KD to that isn't going to hurt that. And then this past year is the only team that I think could maybe give the Warriors some problems, the Nuggets, just because Jokic is such a, you know, how do you guard them? But... You look at the only team that gave the, the Nuggets some problems this year in the playoffs, it was the Suns. And uh, the Suns, that have KD, and I think that KD with that Warriors team is just a better supporting cast for him than the current, or, you know, the last year's Suns. So that's my kind of take on, on KD leaving the Warriors. I think for his legacy, it was a mistake, but you can't, you know, it's easy to look at everything in hindsight. So that was kind of my rationale behind I don't think KD's going to leave because, you know, as long as he and Steph are there and healthy, this team is going to be at at worst a conference final team, um, and if not finals. Um, looking at the the Boston and Kyrie side of the equation, um, this is a team we're definitely going to cover in one of the next chronicles. It's going to be the Kyrie Irving Boston Celtics era because um, that is a crazy story in of its own. But we're going to sum it up really quickly is that they just didn't work out locker room wise, chemistry wise. The team just didn't seem to like each other. Um, Kyrie even said like he wasn't really ready to be in that leadership role. And, you know, that was kind of the whole reason he went to Boston was to break off from LeBron and kind of set his own thing up. And uh, he even said later on, like, yeah, I, I kind of took LeBron for granted because I wasn't ready to be a leadership for a locker room. He's admitted this. So 
you get to the 2019 free agency period. I remember the day it happened, getting the report, seeing Kevin Durant sign with the Brooklyn Nets. Um, I was I was shocked. Um, I, I I was not seeing this coming. Um, you know, there were there were rumors flying around that whole you know leading up to that whole free agency period that KD might leave. I just didn't buy it, but it happened. I was shocked. It kind of blew up the NBA world. Um, but we didn't get to see KD play that next season. You know, going into that year, um, KD missed the whole year, and this was the eventually the bubble year. Um, Kyrie, I think Kyrie did play a good amount of that year, um, and he had some really good standout performances. I remember his Nets debut where he had the headband on and he did like the crazy street dribble thing where he like uh, <laughs> fell on the floor. Like if you remember that, that was a funny moment. Um, and he had like fifty or something. He went crazy in his Nets debut. Um, but overall, the Nets, they weren't that good. I think they did squeak into the bubble playoffs, but Kyrie rejected to go for political reasons, and we're going to obviously talk a lot about that kind of is a big reason why the, the big three did fall apart is Kyrie's political stances. But, yeah, he rejected to go to the bubble because of his political views. Um, so the Nets, they didn't really do anything in the bubble. I remember Karis LeVert had one crazy game against the Celtics. I think he went for, like, 50 but overall, they didn't really do anything. I think they got swept by Boston. Um, so, yeah, that leads us up to the 2020-2021 season. Um, and this is the um, the height, the peak of the Brooklyn Nets' big three was this season. Uh, and it's crazy because they only got to the second round. But when you look back on it, this is as far as they ever got. This was the best that they ever looked was this year. Because um, they were already a good team around... I don't remember, I think it was January, I want to say, was when James Harden was traded to Brooklyn. Um, and this kind of was, this was such a big deal at the time. Like, I, people nowadays like to clown on James Harden, say he's washed, and, you know, I've even kind of abandoned him just for his uh, piss-poor mentality. But at the time, James Harden was widely regarded as a top-five player in the NBA. Um, he, he was just fresh off a season of averaging like 36 points per game. So he was looked at as one of the best players in the league. KD was uh, also ranked as a top five player. So H James Harden going to Brooklyn was looked at as insanity. I remember at the time, like the, the national media was freaking out over this because of how the, the collection of talent between those three guys. I mean, you have two top five players in James and KD, and Kyrie arguably at that time was still a top 15 player in the NBA. Have three guys that good all in their prime. I mean, it was insane. Now, this is where it got kind of rocky with the Nets is because they could never really put their big three on the floor together. They only played 16 games together ever. And the, the history of this big three... As much as we talk about it, they played 16 total games together, the three of them. Um, and they went 13-3 and three in that stretch. Um, they were incredible to watch. I remember the, just the few, very few sample size I remember watching. It was like, who's going to stop this team? Uh, and people forget, James Harden, when he got to Brooklyn, led the MVP ladder for a month because that's how good he was when he initially got to Brooklyn. Um, and this might be a controversial take, but I think that – that first like that that first month stint in Brooklyn is arguably the best version of James Harden ever. It's even I think better than like his years prior in Houston because he had the scoring ability, but he was also showing off his playmaking ability and his command of the offense, you know? Like this is something that kind of drives me crazy that people forget how good James Harden was on the Nets before his uh, injury because he was really good and like I said for about a month he was at the very top of NBA.com's NBA MVP ladder. He was number one for about four weeks. Um, then he gets hurt, and this is where you kind of have the mishmash of, you know, we don't know who's playing tonight. Is it going to be a cut? some combination of the big three or maybe just one of them playing? And this is where the chemistry gets kind of murky because, you know, already they traded for James midway through the season, so it's like already there the chemistry is kind of weird. Even though he was fitting in perfectly, you know, Kyrie even embraced – James being the lead ball handler. He was like, you play point guard, I'll be shooting guard. And uh, they were thriving in that role. You know, even without KD, uh, Harden and Kyrie together were incredible. Um, but this is where some of the problems started to happen where you had, um, you know, who, we don't know who's going to be playing tonight. Uh, Harden missed some time. KD missed some time. But all that being said, going into the playoffs that year, 
And they played Boston. Um, Brooklyn was the two seed. Boston was the seven seed. And Brooklyn was finally, finally, you know, looking like they were starting to put the pieces together. You know, Harden, it was reported Harden was very close to being back from injury. Uh, and Kyrie was was fully healthy. KD was back from his injury. It's looking like, okay, they get hit Harden back. They're going to be able to win the title this year potentially. Um, but what happens? Kyrie Irving gets hurt in the Boston Celtics series and is out for the season. That that one thing there is the um, one of the most consequential parts of this this thing breaking up because I think if Kyrie doesn't get hurt that year um, with how good Kevin Durant was playing, I think that they would have beat that Bucks team. Um, and obviously, like I said earlier, the Bucks were the team that went on to win the title that year. Um, James Harden, 1,000% rushed back from his hamstring injury. That's not even debatable. Um, and that's why James Harden looked so bad in the second round is because he saw how good KD was doing, um, you know, after they beat Boston. I can't remember. I, I think it went five. I don't think it was a sweep. I think it went five. Um, and, uh... So, yeah, James Harden, like, there was no Kyrie, there was no Harden for the first couple games of that second-round series. But KD was playing so good, it made no sense, because it's like, okay, well, KD's without his second and third best player. Like, this shouldn't even really be a series. The Bucks should be mopping the floor with the Nets. But KD was just playing, you know, arguably his best basketball of his career in that series. That's how good he was. So Harden rushed back. Um, and I can't remember off the top of my head, like this is some of the stuff I probably should have researched, but I'm pretty sure game seven of that series was the one where Harden came back. I don't think he played in any other of the games. I think game seven was when he did come back. I'll never forget watching that game. Harden was like, I, I hadn't seen Harden play that bad in a long time, but we all know why is because he rushed back from his hamstring injury. Um, so he was kind of just out there as a decoy. Like he really, really didn't provide anything. Um, but Kevin Durant in that game had one of his best games. Even in game six, I think he had 49 points, something like that. Uh, he was making a case to be the best player in the world, I think, at that point in time. Um, but that fateful shot where his foot was just a smidge on the line, I'll never forget watching that live because I thought in that moment, there's no effing way he just did that. He made that three, won the series. They're advancing to the conference final. Like, He's the best player in the world right now. However, they do an official review. His foot was on the line by a centimeter. And that that one thing is the most consequential uh, thing to happen, I think, in recent NBA history. Because if his foot is just back and it was a three, Brooklyn wins that. I think they're pretty comfortably beating Atlanta in the conference final. And then it's kind of a toss-up between them and Phoenix. I think that they ultimately were just a better team than Phoenix that year. So a whole different world where if they win that championship that year, this team would probably still be intact. You know, whenever you win a title, it kind of allows you to overlook some of the other stuff that was going on behind the scenes with the Nets. So that is, I think, the most consequential thing to happen in recent NBA memory. Um, they lose, um, and that's kind of the, the start of the downfall for the Brooklyn Nets. That's as good as it ever got was that second-round series against Milwaukee. Milwaukee goes on to win the title, um, and we enter the next year with our big three. Um, they're all healthy, but there's a big, uh, big worry for the team because Kyrie, and this is, again, another thing. It's just kind of like a snowball effect of things building up to make this team break apart. Um, I would say the biggest factor in this team breaking apart was Kyrie Irving's vac stance. And, uh, stance. Um and I don't care if you're anti-vax or if you're pro-vax. I don't care. I'm not making a political statement with this video. I'm just saying personally, um, the way I view it is the Brooklyn Nets were paying Kyrie Irving uh, upside of $30 million per year to play basketball. And if you can't get an injection because you're too selfish, um, I think that that is really ultimately what it came down to is Kyrie was selfish trying to make a political stance every other person on the team was willing to get the jab um it, it kind of is infuriates me as someone who was at the time a massive Harden fan I wanted to see this Nets team succeed um and so Kyrie I get it it's a political thing it, it's it's a um a hot t topic to talk about I don't want to get into politics on this channel but I think if you're being paid that much money 
to provide the Brooklyn Nets your services, and then you're just going to give not only the organization that made you so wealthy, but also your teammates. You're going to give them a giant middle finger for your political stance. I think that that's extremely selfish, and that's kind of what led to the downfall of this team um, because he was only allowed to play in road games. So obviously, New York City was one of the most strict in terms of COVID protocols, so he was not allowed to play at home games. So it was a mess. In and out of the lineup, um, KD got hurt again in like November or December of that year of 2021. Um, And this is where we started to hear the initial rumblings of James Harden might want out of Brooklyn. And in my head, I saw that and I laughed. I was like, that's BS. He just got there. There's no way he would leave. This team is is way too talented. They have too much um, going for them for him to just leave this soon. You know, it hadn't even been a year he'd been there and these rumors started coming out. Um, But... This vac stuff killed the, the, the locker room. It killed the, the chemistry. Something that I kind of glossed over back whenever it happened in the, this timeline was Steve Nash's hiring. Um, and the only reason Steve Nash was hired as a head coach was because he was Kevin Durant's good friend. Um, that's the only reason. Because from an X's and O standpoint, Steve Nash should have never been an NBA head coach. He never coached at a high school level, a college level, even as an assistant. He was never a head coach of anything. And he was given a head coaching job in the NBA. And he was clearly in over his head, didn't know what the hell he was doing. And he's another reason why this didn't work out because he just didn't, he was in over his head. You have the Kyrie stuff happening. You have the chemistry issues. You have poor management. You have bad coaching. uh, And you have a lot of big egos in that locker room. All this is just kind of like the perfect storm to lead for this thing to blow up as fast as it did. Now, looking back on it, I think that they should have just sucked it up and kind of held in there because... Even with the current iteration of these players, I still think if the three of them were together right now that they'd be one of the league favorites. So I I do think it is uh, a regrettable move. But James Harden did end up requesting a trade and was traded at that trade deadline to the Philadelphia 76ers. And that was it. That was the end of the Brooklyn Big Three. Uh, It lasted essentially about a year and some change. I want to say like a year and two months, something like that, because I'm pretty sure he was traded there in um, January of 2021, and then he was traded away February of 2022. So, yeah, a year and a month he was there in Brooklyn. Um, And you look at what Brooklyn gave up for James Harden and the fact that he was only there for that short amount of time, it's going to go down as one of the worst trades. And even at the time, I thought – I thought it was actually the other way around. I thought Houston got fleeced because they didn't even get the tangible assets a part of the trade. You know, Jared Allen and Karis LeVert, they were looked at as like the young trade pieces you'd get in the trade for for Harden. And they didn't even get that. Jared Allen went to Cleveland somehow, and Karis LeVert went to Indiana. And Oladipo came to Houston with all the picks. Oladipo didn't even last a year in Houston. So I was like looking at this. I'm like, this is going to go down as one of the worst trades ever. Houston got fleeced. And now just, you know, a year later, it, it looks uh, completely different. That's why you got to give these big trades uh, time to, you know, mature and see how it plays out. Because now it's like a 180 from when it happened for me. Um, so, yeah, Harden goes to Philly. You got Katie and Kyrie still in Brooklyn. Uh, and that playoff year, um, I thought Harden and Embiid, they were going to be like a really good match, and they were. But there was a key thing with uh, that Sixers team is they just weren't able to stay healthy, Uh, particularly Embiid. You know, if you remember that first round against Toronto, Joel Embiid was incredible, but he, again, got injured. Um, Then they played, the Sixers played Miami in the uh, second round, and they lost because of Embiid's injuries. Looking at the Brooklyn side of it, it's kind of ironic that the year prior, they beat up on Boston, and then this year, the 2022 playoffs, they got swept by the Celtics. I remember, like, <laughs> it was one of the craziest things I had ever seen, to see Kevin Durant swept in a playoff series, in a first-round playoff series. And like we said, the year prior, the Nets were the two seed, the Celtics were the seven seed. It was flipped. Uh, Celtics were two, Nets were seven, because uh, KD, when he was gone, they were bad. Um and it's kind of, it, it sucks because I remember how good they started off the 2022 season and KD before his injury was like leading in the MVP race. But it seems like he always gets injured right at the same time. And it's like right around like now, like November, December, January is usually when KD gets hurt. The past two or three years now, that's kind of been the case with KD. Um, 
So yeah, they, they get swept. Then that offseason happens not that long ago, about a year and a half ago, if you guys remember, Kevin Durant requested a trade from Brooklyn. Um, nobody really bit because, you know, they were asking too much. And KD had to, like, go back to the team with his tail between his legs. Even after calling, or excuse me, calling for the firing of the head coach Nash, the GM Sean Marks, even though he's the only one who wanted Steve Nash there. That's the thing that kind of pisses me off about this is Kevin Durant acted like one of the big things that drove him away from the Nets was the fact that Steve Nash was the head coach. You're the only reason Steve Nash was the head coach, KD. So that that thing kind of made me mad. Um, but like I said, tail between his legs, had to go back to the Nets because they were not able to find a trade partner at that time. Uh, and they started off last season. They had some nice moments here and there. Um, Nash was eventually fired in November. They um, promote Jacques Vaughn. Um, and they looked all right. And that's kind of like the, the sad part of this is because every time Kevin Durant was actually on the floor for Brooklyn, he, they were a good team. They were a really good team. But that's the key. They were never able to keep Kevin Durant on the floor. Or if he was on the floor, like in the playoffs in 2021, his supporting cast wasn't playing. So it was like, it was just they could never get their timeline matched up. And it just fell apart with very, very bad management from the Brooklyn Nets. Um, Kyrie Irving was then traded to Dallas um, for Spencer Dinwiddie, Dorian Finney-Smith, and I think a, a pick or two. Um, then it was KD, like the lone man in Brooklyn. It was him for like a couple days, and he was traded to Phoenix. And that's where we stand now. Um, you know, they made it to the second round this past year. Um, they're kind of struggling this year. I think they're like the seventh seed. And it's kind of the same thing that's happening right now in Phoenix that happened in Brooklyn. Whenever you, ha whenever you rely your whole franchise on three stars, if one of them gets hurt, the team's going to struggle. Bradley Beal hasn't been able to stay healthy at all this season. Devin Booker's been in and out of the lineup. Kevin Durant's probably going to get hurt now. So it's kind of like we're repeating the same thing just with a different team and different players. So that's kind of been my uh, rant here uh, for the NBA Chronicles. I do plan on doing a couple other uh, teams that I want to talk about. Like I said, I do want to talk about the Kyrie Celtics. I do want to talk about the Chris Paul Phoenix Suns. Um, there's a couple other ones, but if there's anyone that comes to your mind, um, go ahead and leave in the comments a team that you'd like to see me do this long format kind of story telling of. Um, so if you made it this far, if you li uh, listen to me ramble this long, I really, really appreciate it. Uh, go ahead and leave a comment definitely and like and subscribe.